God is perfect in all of his ways. Yeah, he's perfect. Even when we don't understand, it doesn't change the fact that God is perfect in all of his ways. Even when we don't understand, it doesn't change the fact that God is love and that he loves us with an everlasting love that is unfailing, unrivaled, unmatched, and is always faithful. Let's talk about love this morning. Obviously, we came off of a week where we have, you know, the world's big love day, Valentine's Day, and we all think we've got it a little bit figured out at this point. Maybe you don't. Maybe a lot of people do. But we're talking about love. There's a lot of things that when it comes to Jesus and his love for us that we really don't fully comprehend or understand. John 11, we're in the book of John. John 11, verse 5 and 6 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. He loved them. Verse 6, so when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he, let's just stop right there. Because the way we understand love we're going to fill this out a little bit differently than what Scripture says. He loved them so much. So what do you think he did? He stayed where he was two more days. Have you ever read those two passages of Scripture and actually put them together? Or have you been like me where you kind of read verse 5? Now, Jesus loved Mary or loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, period, kind of stop. And then we go to another sentence as if they don't connect at all. But they actually do. But what happens when the sentiment of love and the subsequent action doesn't seem to go together? Now, Brent loved Carla more than anything. So when he heard that she desperately needed him to come home, he stayed where he was two more days. Now, I don't want to know what the end of that story would sound like or what it would be like. <laughs> But that doesn't sound like love. And yet we know, most of us know the end of the Lazarus story, but but Martha and Mary and the people around did it. They didn't know the end. So it doesn't make sense to them that Jesus, who loves them, would delay. He would delay his visit because they need the miracle worker to show up, the one who loves them, by the way, to show up and heal his friend, Lazarus. We're in the final message of our series, Miracles, Let Him Be Known, where we've been looking at the miracles that are written in the account of the Gospel of John, seven miracles that we've looked at. This is the seventh that we're looking at today. It kind of culminates with this big miracle. And all of them pointing to the fact that Jesus is in fact the Son of God, that He would be made known. And the morning's message entitled today is, What is Love? Because we all think we know. But let's think about it. Let's reconsider it. Let's think about it again. Martha and Mary and Lazarus need a miracle of healing or Lazarus is going to die. So when he heard Lazarus was sick, instead of rushing to his side, he waited two more days. Now, depending on which commentaries you read, but most people say, well, you see like maybe it was a day's travel, but a lot of of, of stuff that you read says he was only a couple of miles away. Like maybe a 40-minute walk or a good 10-minute cross-country run, right? That's how close he was. It'd be like me being in Thompson and, and Carla desperately needing me to come home. And I'm just, she knows where I am. You're just 30 minutes away by a car. It's like a 40 minute walk. And yet he didn't come. So when he heard Lazarus was sick, instead of rushing to his side, Jesus stayed where he was, and Lazarus, he died. He he actually was probably dead by the time the message got to Jesus, is what we understand. This doesn't seem to be an appropriate way to share the love. We're talking about a share the love initiative that we're in right now between now and Easter Sunday. This doesn't seem the appropriate way to share this love that you say that you have and that everybody knows that you have, but that's exactly what the Scripture says that we just read. Now, Jesus loved 
Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. You know what the scripture is telling us? He's, the scripture is actually telling us that Jesus waited two more days because he loved them. Although this doesn't seem very loving to me and probably not to you, the scripture says that's exactly what's going on. Because isn't the hero supposed to come in at the right time and save the day? Isn't the hero supposed to get there right at the right moment, just we're watching the movie, and the hero comes right before death enters the picture and saves the day? And yet Jesus is redefining what we think is heroism. He's redefining what we believe he's here to do. He's redefining who we think that he is and his timetable. He's redefining that by not showing up when everybody thought that he should have showed up. Jesus isn't doing this to our preconceived ideas of who he is and how he operates. His plans are greater as we often sing. His plans are higher. And I don't say that flippantly because a lot of times that can be said, well, you know, somebody just went through something painful, difficult, or maybe dealing with death and somebody goes, well, you know, his plans are higher. I don't want to hear that right now. Well, his plans are greater. I get that. But here's where we miss the connection. It's not just that his plans are higher. It's not just that his plans are greater. It's his plans are higher, his plans are greater, and at the same exact time, his love is unfailing. It doesn't change. We just leave it at higher and greater as if his love is is separated from his highness and his greatness of his plans. No, all of his plans are loving. Yes, they may be higher. Yes, they may be greater. But God is sovereign. And all at the same time, his love is unrivaled and unfailing. In this particular case, the reason for Jesus delaying his arrival is actually given to us in verse 4. So if we back up, if you've got your Bible today, this is our passage. This is our text today, John 11. We're reading through this. So if you back up to the passage I just read, John 11, 5 and 6, into chapter, verse 4, we see the reason. So the sisters, actually verse 3, sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. You see this over and over again. it's, It's clear. Jesus loves them. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. He's not denying that death is going to happen. He knows what's going to happen. But he says, no, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through this. What's happening? God's going to glorify himself through it. In other words, it was more loving to put Lazarus through an earthly death and his sisters, Mary and Martha, through earthly grief if it would reveal more of God's glory to them and more of the glory of Christ to those who would see. Here's how Jesus loves us the most, church. Jesus loves us the most by showing us more of himself. That's how he loves us the most. What happens, however, when the more loving way, the more loving thing is the more difficult way and it doesn't feel loving? Because we've all been there. We've all been there when the more loving way didn't feel very loving to us. I was driving down the road, I think it was probably Thursday or maybe it was Wednesday, I can't remember which day. And this thought popped into my head as I was thinking about this story and I was thinking about what God was doing, about what doesn't feel like love. And here's what I want to share with you. When God's love doesn't feel like love in a way that we have ever known, then we must look for his love in a way that we have never seen. That's what's going on here. This doesn't feel like love in a way that Mary and Martha and the rest of the people have ever known. But Jesus wants them to see love in a way they've never seen it. See, remember the emphasis of the entire gospel of John is that Jesus would be revealed as the son of God, that he would reveal the glory of God in Jesus so that we would see something that we haven't seen. So the readers of the gospel would see something that they had never seen before. And that's the love of Christ in Jesus as the son of God, the savior of the world, that they would believe in him and have eternal life. That's what John 20, 31 says. But these are written so that you may believe what is written. All these miracles that we've been talking about so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing Believing you may have life in his name. See, there's no greater love than to know Jesus 
as Savior and Lord. There's no greater love than knowing Jesus and believing that He is in fact the Son of God and the Savior of our lives. So this is where our ideas of love may differ because God does not mainly love us in this life by sparing us from suffering and death. I'll say that again because sometimes we've heard a gospel that tells us something else and it's not the gospel. See, God doesn't mainly love us in this life by sparing us from suffering and death. He mainly loves us by showing us and giving us himself and giving us his glory in the middle of this life to be with us in every valley and to make sure that death doesn't have the final word when it comes. See, God loves us mainly by giving us himself and all that he is for us in Jesus. And Jesus loves us mainly by giving us himself and all that God is for us in him. Don't measure the love of God for you by how much health and wealth and comfort he brings to your life. If that were the measure of God's love, then God hated the Apostle Paul and every other disciple that we read about. Measure God's love for you, church, by how much of himself that he shows you in every season and every circumstance of life. Measure God's love for you by how much of himself he shares with you to know and to enjoy through every season of life. Let's stay here for a minute. Because if this is love, what we just read, that he loves them, if this is love, it doesn't feel like love to anybody in this narrative. Not to Mary, not to Martha, not to the mourners that are gathering around, watching. No one that we know of in Bethany, which is where all this is taking place, where Lazarus has died, is feeling the love of Jesus right now. I don't feel the love. What we see here again is something I said a few weeks ago. We're not very good at judging our own spiritual experiences. We're not very good at it. And we're really not good at judging the spiritual experience of other people many times. Because we value what God doesn't value and we undervalue what God calls costly. For example, everybody in this narrative doubts Jesus' love for Mary, for Martha, and particularly for Lazarus because he's dead. And the mourners all begin to question Jesus, just like Mary and Martha. They all begin to question Jesus. Maybe it's thinly veiled, but there's some question there, and there's some doubt. And this doubt visibly shakes Jesus. Why? Why does them doubting him and his love visibly shake him and cause him to weep? Yes, I believe that he was empathizing, and he was weeping because his friend had died, and he, didn't, he was angry at death, but I think there was more there. I think Jesus was weeping and upset because if there's one thing Jesus is, it is love. Incarnate. That's who God is. God is love. And if there's one thing that hurts him and us, it's doubting his love for us. Here's Martha's response, verse 20. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Here's Mary's response, verse 32. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then there's the mourners, everybody that's gathered around, everybody in this town that would have known Jesus. These are his friends. They've heard about what he's doing. Jesus, it says in verse 35, wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, this is, well, if he loved him, could, he not, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Nobody was feeling the love of Jesus. Nobody was sensing that he loved them. And I think that's what upset Jesus the most. So you probably understand this kind of painful misunderstanding in life. I think we've all experienced it a little bit. When you do something loving or kind for somebody and it's misinterpreted, misrepresented, and even used to impinge your character. Wait, I did this because I love you. 
And then somebody turns that around and begins to, however you want, gaslight you, if you want to use that word, impinge your character, doubt who you are, and your motivation for what you did was because of your deep love for them. See, Jesus had chosen to love Lazarus and his sisters and even the onlookers by not coming immediately. And now his tardiness in their minds is being used to question his love. See, if you'd come right away, none of this would have happened. Lazarus would still be alive. We wouldn't be around this tomb crying. But there's not a breath, my friends, that Jesus has taken in his life that wasn't filled with love. There's not a thought that God has that isn't loving. There isn't a thing that God does or that Jesus did that isn't full of love. So to question his love is to question his very essence. And Jesus wept. There's a scripture, right, that says that God proved his love for us by sending his son while we were still sinners. That he sent his son to take our place. And yet here, they're doubting the fact that Jesus actually loves them. Verse 21, Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now we know scripture tells us that Jesus is what? Not as, he's not just love, but he's also the truth. He also says that if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. And that's exactly what he does here. He begins to set everybody free by speaking the truth. Jesus responds to the doubt of his love with true truth about himself and what's really going on here. Jesus reveals his glory in his truth-filled words. He says, you believe that there's this great and glorious day of resurrection coming at the end of the age when all believers are going to be raised bodily from the grave. You believe that, Martha, and you're right. And here's the mystery. I am the arrival of that day. You thought that day would come with the Messiah. I am that Messiah. It has come. I'm revealing my power to you. I'm revealing my glory to you. Because why? Because I love you. And he's saying, let me be specific, Martha. I'm exactly what Lazarus needs. And you are going to see what you need in this as well. I'm exactly what Lazarus needs and exactly what you need. He is dead and you are alive. So listen, verse 25, the one who believes in me will live even though they die. That's for Lazarus. Verse 26, and whoever lives by believing in me We'll never die. Martha, that's for you. I will rescue Lazarus, body and soul. I will not let him be corrupted or decay in the grave. But as great as that is, there is something, in fact, greater than that. Greater for you than I'm trying to show you right now. Why? Because you live and believe in me because of that miracle. Here's what's greater. You will never die. There will never be one millisecond that you're going to be separated from my saving fellowship and love for you as your Savior. And do you know what that means, Martha? Do you know what that means, Martha? I know it doesn't feel like it. But it means that I love you. That's what it means, Martha. I love you, and I love your brother. I will not abandon his soul to the pit. I will raise him up, and I will keep you in everlasting fellowship with me. I'm telling you this. I'm revealing my power. I'm revealing my glory to you right now and everybody else that's on looking because I love you. Let's pick up in verse 38. 
And this is where we see the crowd kind of weigh in with their opinion. Because you know the crowd's always got an opinion as well. Usually the crowd's opinion isn't very good. But they're doubting the character of Jesus as well. They're doubting his love, which is who he is. They're doubting his power, which all power belongs to him. And that we will see Jesus is asking us not only to believe, but what we're going to see in this response to the mourners is that he's also asking us to participate with him. Believers are to participate in and with Jesus in restoring his mission to the world. But this is just a foreshadowing of what those who are part of the resurrection community are going and are supposed to do and what we're called to do even today. Verse 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. It's like they said, it's like a big round stone, so it could kind of be rolled over and rolled back, but not easily. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been in there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, and I'm not going to do it the way it probably was because it would scare the crap out of you. Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, and his hands and feet were wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. See, initially we see Jesus commanding them to do something hard that also required faith. It was hard to move this stone. It wasn't meant to be moved. Nobody wanted to move that stone because there's something dead behind it. And nobody wanted that. So it was hard to move. There's a large stone blocking the cave. It would have taken several people to move it, which is a physical, practical action that they had to do in obedience to what Jesus said. This is how it usually works in the body of Christ, church. We expect miracles, and I've said this throughout this entire series, just to happen without our involvement. And yet Jesus is asking us to do the things that he's commanding us to do and to take part in some maybe physical or hard action by faith at his command. And this is how it works. Jesus, the head of the body, commands the body what to do, and we do it. Or else why is he the head of a body? For us today, it will take the resurrected community, which is the church, that's what we are, to obey God in doing the heavy and hard things, both physically and spiritually, in order to participate in the mission that God has called us to participate in. It has never been about one person. It's never been about just me personally doing something. It has always been about a people who serve God together through one God, one spirit, in the name of one Savior, Ephesians 4 says, Jesus Christ, the Savior of all. We have done some heavy lifting in Focus Church. We have done some hard things as in Focus Church. And it takes us doing this together, and it's only possible when we do it as one at the command of the head of this body, Jesus Christ. So in addition to this practical, physical action of faith, there was also a spiritual action of faith because there was a decomposing dead man behind this stone. There's a spiritual action of faith that says, well, okay, once we roll the stone away, what the heck are we going to find? We can't see, but we're going to trust what Jesus is saying. Martha and John make it very clear. Here's what we know. They're making it very clear. They even call him the dead man at some point. They don't even call him Lazarus anymore. He's just the dead man. They're making it very clear. Lazarus is dead. There's no doubt. There's no arguing. Even this fourth day is very important because traditionally it would be three days and they go check just to make sure. Traditionally, they would check after three days to make sure that the person was actually dead. So here's this fourth day being mentioned because they're emphasizing Lazarus is dead dead really dead. This is important, and it reminds me a little bit of Elijah in the Old Testament. 
right? When he's going against the prophets of Baal, and he says, listen, let's just build a, a pyre out here, and let's see whose God will engulf this thing with fire. Oh, before we do that, just to make sure that I'm not pulling any tricks out of my sleeve, I'm just going to douse this thing with water, and then I'm going to dig a trench around it and fill that up with water. There's going to be so much water on this thing, there's no way except that a heavenly, powerful God that is above all gods would engulf it and eviscerate it with flames. So Lazarus is dead, dead. There's only one way he's coming back to life. And it's through the power of a God who can raise the dead. It's the same for us spiritually that's going on with Lazarus. See, until we recognize that we're not just bad, until we recognize we're not just messed up, we're not just decent and need of a little bit of help to do better, we're not just sin sick, we are dead in our sin. We are dead, Scripture says, in our trespasses and sin, and we need a Savior. And until we realize that, we will not be coming out of the grave of our old life. We're dead dead. As one translation says it in Martha's words, we're stinketh dead, meaning corrupt, meaning decaying. That's what it means. We're corrupt. And the stinketh part means Lazarus and you and I, metaphorically apart from Christ, are not just dead, but we're corrupted, meaning we are decaying and we're decomposing and we're going dust back to dust. And this is actually good news because it's in this place where we're beyond dead, where all hope is lost, where the wood has been doused with water and there's nothing in our power or anybody else's that can be done to reverse the decomposition that Jesus, who is incorruptible, Psalm 16 says, is the one that steps in to this situation. He never saw decay, Psalm said, and he prophesies and he speaks and the dead and the decaying come back to life. I want to make a point that Jesus was praying in verse 41 and 42, but Scripture says he wasn't praying for his sake. You ever do that with your kids? I already know what I've been praying for you, but I'm going to pray it out loud with you. This is exactly what's going on. Jesus already knew what was going to happen. He'd already been praying to the Father. The Father already told him what was going to happen. He even says... You already know, I've already prayed this. You've already heard my prayer. But I'm praying this now because I'm going to do a preach, teach prayer right now so everybody around can hear. Jesus has already prayed about this. He confidently knows what's going to happen. He's praying out loud for the sake of the audience. And he also addresses God as Father, not our Father like he taught the disciples to pray, but Father, also showing that he has an intimacy with God and he is doing the will of his Father. Verse 43, Jesus called in a loud voice, as I said, Lazarus, come out! Because I don't know how you read this, and I don't know how I've read it in the past, but we just kind of, Lazarus, come out. Bro, that's not how it happened. I mean, listen, if I'm trying to get somebody dead, I, you know, you, you, you're probably going to just have a little emotion. And here, as I'm reading this, this is loud voice means powerful. It means a shout of raw authority. Actually, the Greek word is used six times in the book of John. And you know the other five times that it's used? This is one of them. The other five times is once it's used when the crowds are crying, Hosanna, when Jesus rides in. It's a shout of raw power. And the other four times is when they're shouting, crucify him. A shout of raw power. And in this case, he has that shout, an emotional, raw, powerful shout. It would have gotten everybody's attention. It'd be like me whispering this whole message until I get to this point, and then I just pop it out with all of my vocal performance training. <laughs> Lazarus, I want you to notice in verse 44, the effect of this powerful shout Come out! Lazarus instantaneously comes out. See, this is power, my friends. This is power in the name of Jesus. Power in the name of Jesus when he calls our name. Yes, we call on his name, but my friends, it's first because he calls our name. And when he calls our name, power happens where he calls us out of darkness of our tombs of our life, and it's instantaneous. 
When Jesus calls our name, justification is instantaneous, not progressive. When Jesus calls our name, our past is forgiven immediately, not gradually. When Jesus calls our name, regeneration is done in a moment, not over a period of time. When Jesus calls our name, instantaneously, dead things come back to life. There's power in the name above all names. There is victory in the name of Jesus. There's healing in the name of Jesus. There's deliverance in the name of Jesus. There is alive people coming alive in the name of Jesus. And along with that, I want you to see that although he was brought from death to life instantaneously, there was still work to be done. See, I can get all hyped up about that, and we should. Because my life is now made new instantaneously. It doesn't take years and years and years for my old heart to be given a new heart. For my old life to be dead and my new life to be resurrected. That's instantaneous. But there is still work to be done. That is the power of Christ in us through sanctification. And here's what we see. He's brought from death to life instantaneously, but there's still work to be done. Why? Because as long as we are here, church, as long as we're in this place, church, as long as God has given us time on this earth, there's still work to be done. Work in us and work through us. Work in us and work through us. Verse 44 says, he came out and he still had his grave clothes on. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Yeah, just like a mummy. Just think about it. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes. Let him go. (laughs) Some translations say unbind him. I kind of like that better. Let him go. Why? Lazarus was alive, but he was still bound. Listen, some of you in here today, are you're alive, but you're still bound. And the way that we become unbound is by being a part of the body of Christ, which Jesus is the head. In the community, this resurrected community called the church, because we're the people that believe in the resurrection, are around on looking at what God is doing in your life. And though you're alive and bound, he looks to us and he says, hey, Go and bind him. That's why the body of Christ is so important to you. It's also important because as ministers of mercy, there are going to be a lot of people walking in here looking like mummies. There's going to be a lot of people over the next decade or two or three or four, however long Christ tarries, there's going to be a lot of people that walk into this place. They're going to be alive, but they're still going to be bound. They're going to have old grave clothes on, some old habits, some old lifestyles. And what's Jesus' response to the grave clothes still clinging to Lazarus? Man, why'd you come out here looking like that? No, he says to the crowd, help him. Jesus enlisted the community to care for Lazarus by unwrapping him and by implication covering his nakedness. This is why we need the body of Christ, the church, because there's not a single one of us that's not going to have an old strip of grave clothes on us at some point in time in our life. Not a single one of us. Like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was my old life, and it's trying to wrap itself back around me again. What we can't be is okay with it. So what do we do? We run to our Father, and we run to our family so that we can care for one another encourage one another and cover each other. You do that with the help of your church community, your spiritual family. And I think God's mission for us as the resurrected community is to carry on Christ's work. I know that. That's that's what we're here for. This should be reflected in our care and our concern for people who are dead and in desperate need of Jesus and his church. We untie them. We help them become unbound. We cover them and welcome them back into life and into the community of the resurrected with open arms. This account, this miracle of the glory of Jesus, Jesus raised Lazarus because he was and is the resurrection. See, if you're a believer, you're going to be raised one day from death, and you're going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of your Father forever. That's what the Word tells us. Lazarus is a preview of your resurrection. 
Jesus is coming back to earth in power and in great glory with a shout. And you may say, yeah, that's wonderful, but what about now? Yeah, that's great, but right now I don't feel the love of Christ. What about the waiting that I'm in now? What about the difficulty that I'm in now? What about the pain that I'm going through right now? Well, maybe there's a miracle here for you today. And I pray that that's the case. And I'll pray with you and for you about it. We can pray. But I do want to say this. We don't always see the miracle in this life. People die without a miraculous resurrection. Shoot, Lazarus eventually died. Many of us will walk around and are walking around with bodies that are hurting. The older I get, the more that happens. We're walking around with minds and relationships and situations that feel incredibly broken. All of us have prayers that haven't been answered for months, for years, some of us decades. And you might feel right now just like Mary and Martha in the crowd, unloved. I don't see the love of Jesus in this. But I want you to know, and I want you to remember, what we've been teaching this morning is that Jesus always loves you. No matter what you're feeling, he's waiting on maybe answering your prayer. Why? Because he loves you. Just like this. He waited because he loved them. It's not because he's incapable. It's not because he doesn't care. It's not because he's ignoring you. He's waiting out of his deep and unfailing love for us. He's waiting to reveal his glory to us in a greater way. God is loving you in the middle of your waiting. It's what I said a moment ago. When God's love doesn't feel like love in a way that you've ever known, then here's what we're going to do, church. We're going to begin to look for God's love in a way that we've never seen it. How's God trying to show you his love today? Maybe it's an answer, a miraculous answer to prayer. Maybe that happens today. I, I've been praying all week that God would continue to do miracles in our midst, yes. Or maybe it's an unanswered prayer, and yet you see the glory of Christ in the middle of it. Oh, to see the glory of God. Oh, to know the power of Him calling my name out of the darkness. Oh, to know the power of the name of Jesus as I'm unbound for the things that have bound me up. Jesus, we want to see your glory. We want to see your love in a new way. That's got to be our prayer because God wants to show us himself. He wants to show us his glory. And I don't know how this is going to look for you. I don't know when the day is coming for God to come through in some special or miraculous way. If it's on this side of heaven or if it's in the next resurrected life when everything that is broken is going to be renewed. I don't know. But I do know this. God loves you. And it's hard to see when you're standing at the tomb with tears in your eyes. But I want you to know that the reason you're there is even if the enemy meant harm, God's going to use it for your good. And I'm praying that you see him in a way maybe you've never seen him before, that you sense his love this morning before we walk out of this place in a way maybe you've never sensed it before, that his love for you is not sparing you trials or sparing you suffering or even sparing you death. His love for you is the gift of himself, his glory. And that's what I want to see. That's what I want us to see again and again and again. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, however you desire, Holy Spirit, however you desire to reveal your glory to us, to show your love to us. Lord, as you invite us into your presence, even today as a church, corporately, all of us that are here or watching online, wherever you are listening, that the presence of God would just begin to invade those spaces and those places. Even here this morning, that this presence of God, that the love of God would just engulf our hearts and our minds. Yes, we're praying, and we're going to have people to pray for you, that there may be some things that we're going to see a breakthrough. We're going to see something miraculous today. Maybe it is something physical that you're healed from. Maybe that it's something uh, relational that is, that is fractured that will be healed and mended. But maybe above all of that, we're going to sense and see the love of Jesus in a way that we never have before. 
to see his glory revealed in a way that we never had before. As we sing this, this song this morning, that this is his invitation to us, that we would come. Come to Jesus. Bringing whatever you got and laying it at his feet. And maybe where you're sitting today, it's taking a posture of worship through kneeling. Maybe you've you come to the altar. It's like, well, what's the altar? Well, really, it's just the front. And you just kneel there, just in a moment of saying, God, I want to see your glory. I want to see your love. Lord, have your way in us today.